So I'm going to be talking about personal annual reports today. I've got some samples up here to take a look at too. Uh, I am not going to pass these around while I'm talking because then you will pay zero attention to me. That's exactly what I would do. So, um, and I haven't actually run through this. So I have no idea how long this is going to take and we'll just make it as, as interactive as we can. But So a personal annual report is... Uh, Annual reports come from the corporation kind of mindset where uh, to communicate with shareholders the results of the previous year, financial results, and, and part of the story, uh, corporations have been doing that for uh, decades. So um, a while back, some in individuals started to do that same type of concept to, to uh, bring about the data that they captured throughout the year and tell a story through it uh, in a printed form. And we'll see kind of the evolution of that uh, later on. So uh, it's just blending beautiful design. Uh, the people that uh, that I've highlighted are designers, um, and uh, we'll we'll see the evidence of that. Data collection, analysis, gallery quality printing, which you'll be able to put your hands on. Um, personal reflection and behavior modification, all in one routine. Um, has anybody ever um, looked into personal annual reports before? Has anybody heard of any of these guys? Heard, heard of Felton, just in okay. someone's blog posting somewhere. Okay. So um, basically, kind of the way I envision walking through this is there are three masters um, that I've been following now for several years, and we're just going to kind of go through their work um, um, and then uh, talk a little bit about what I'm trying to do this year and kind of what I've gleaned from other people doing it. And then we'll just open it up after that. So the, the masters are Nicholas Felton. He is uh, the main one. Uh, he's kind of the one who got it all started. Jahia Zipitar, I think. Uh, and Michael Anthony. So Felton is, um, his um, kind of handles Feltron. So you might see him as that uh, or as Felton. So it, like his Twitter handle is Feltron. And a lot of his work is signed Feltron, but his name is Felton. Um, so we'll just dive right in. Felton, Nicholas Felton is the, is the pioneer, or the patriarch. Started all the way back in 2005. He's been doing this every year since 2005. His work is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, he's done a lot of different data collection methods from, um, uh, I've read interviews where one year he put every single thing he did in his Google Calendar. So you could just see this massive, like he had 30 entries on a day. Um, so it wasn't that he used the calendar as a way to tell you what I need to do in the future. It was a way that he could record what was happening in the present. And that was just his medium for capturing the data. Uh, he used a, an app called Reporter that he co-developed that we'll be able to see in a little bit. And also personal mementos from his family. Uh, but the key there is he produces finely printed books. So I have three of them. Um, uh, for instance, this is the one from 2010. It's numbered 1669 of 3000, signed. And he makes these, uh, they cost about 35 bucks a piece. Um, and he makes them, prints them one time, and uh, super great quality, you'll be able to see in a little bit. Um, and then that's it, that's, that's the end of them. So he puts the work online, but his are really more about the actual book, which is kind of how it got started, because corporations produce actual books for distribution to their shareholders to communicate the story of what's, what management has done over, over the time. So let's see here. Um, so above all, these are pieces of artwork on paper. They're designed from the very beginning to be viewed and interacted with on a piece of paper. Um, there's a, just a little example. Felton has done work in, uh, he's worked at Facebook. He was one of the co-designers of Timeline. Um, and uh, has worked um, at Newsweek and just a ton of different um, uh, major brands. So there's just an example of his food consumption. That's one of the earlier reports. So I, got, I started with the 2010 one. I had been looking at his reports prior to that, but never had the um, kind of drive to actually purchase one until now. Uh, I went back and looked through this week to try to find, does anybody, is there a secondary market for these? And I couldn't find one anywhere. Um, 
He builds entire new ways to display data. So this is one of his ways that he um, showed some geographical information. Um, and that is folded up into a book, but he also had a poster size version of that, of that display. And then finally, the, he used an annual report as history. So there I'm going to transition to actually go through some of these books a little bit. Um, so this is the 2010 version. Uh, this is a very interesting one. It's called the Paternal Report. Um, so this is a, he had been doing this from 2005 to 2009 and producing a report each year. But um, around this time frame, his father died. And he used the 2010 version of the book as a way to study his father and to honor his father. And so this book, this annual report, is a uh, study of his father's life. So it starts um, from when he was born, and he used um, all kinds of calendar entries from his father, birth certificates, licenses. Uh, his father did keep a little bit of more notes than the normal person, nothing like, like his son did, but he did leave behind a good amount of, of data that uh, postcards, for instance, back and forth from, from his family to himself. Uh, so he used this book to, to capture his father's life. So I just want to kind of give an example. Here is the first page, um, and you'll notice... A bunch of different, so this is his um, materials list. He uses neat little blocks to, this says 25 different sources. And so you'll see these numbers pop out to draw your attention, but then the way he just describes, these are his 25 sources, which is applications, audio recordings, books, calendars, certificates, uh, on and on, and kind of outlines those in a little form um, that matches the rest of the data displayed there. Um, kind of look at, at the page here. So this is the, um, talks about his birthplace, his genealogy, his time in England. Again, this is his father, his school reports. So he's bridging this little bit of information he can gather and treating it like he does his own life where he has tons of data. And I, I think some interesting things here. So. Like you'll see his best subjects was mathematics, based on a 90% average exam mark, and um, days absent from school 11, including six days in autumn. So you see these little, just little tidbits, along with very poignant information, like right down here it says, father killed March 10th, 1942, at um, Sheshwishin, I'm not sure of the name, concentration camp. So you see those, those you know, bits of the story right embedded inside the rest of it. And you can, as you read through this, you really understand a story about his entire life. And it's told in this, in this, um, in this way of presenting data that we're all getting more and more used to, of uh, really technical information interspersed with those types of little tidbits about his life. Um, the music page, I wanted to highlight here. So, um, here's audio recordings that his, that his dad had, um, and so he lists the number, the type, the, like the genre between jazz, classical, educational, most represented artist, Miles Davis, and then you switch over there, and you see uh, his last day, September 12, 2010. He died at 81 years, 2 months, and 8 years old, and then right underneath that, the weather. 49.8 degrees Fahrenheit and overcast in Lake Spur, Larkspur, California. So it's just a, a neat way to integrate the data that is prepared and captured for the individual along with little bits of story. Uh, 2010 and 11, he produced a biannual report. So he used 2010 to produce uh, the one about his dad, but that meant he had two years of personal data. So he captured it here. And so I'll just kind of, so for instance, that is his, basically like his check-in list. So he kept track. This is his 2010 page. This is his 2011 page. One thing I think is interesting, there's a couple of redactions here in 2011. And for someone who lives such a, I mean, this is a pretty, shows a lot of intimacy 
that he has. This is a study of his basic uh, place and person. Um, but those couple redactions I'm very curious about. What, what, what could possibly be uh, um, more personal than this that you want to go ahead and mark that out? But. Uh, we may never know. Or maybe it's out there and I just don't know. And also telling you that he redacted it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could just delete it. That's right. That's right. That's like a secret there. Like, yeah. <laughs> and it's nowhere else in here. Black bar there. So this is kind of a neat. Um, at this point in his life, he was moving back and forth a lot between San Francisco and New York City. So he lived in New York City principally, but he worked for Facebook a lot in San Francisco. So you can see a bunch of time back and forth. So like this is his couple pages with Ryan. So this is a study of his interactions with Ryan. Here it is in the Bay Area, a piece of geographic, and here it is on New York City with Olga, which I think is his wife or girlfriend, um, in the Bay Area and in New York City. Um, then, let's see. Oh, on uh, page three, I love this. So this is kind of his summary for uh, uh, in the U.S. He's got days in the U.S. 704, time out of state, most visited states, New York, California, Alaska, Minnesota, Colorado. The next entry here is animals saved, an octopus, freed from a shrimp pot in Prince William Sound, Alaska. And so if we look back, whoops. Screen saver. Uh, um, if we look back, if you remember the picture that we used for him, yeah, I think that is that picture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just made that connection this morning because I, I saw that picture. I was trying to find interesting pictures of him. That one sure popped up. Um, and then I read this little piece here. Um, so we'll come back to that. But it's just interesting the way he intersperses those little bits of story along with the routine. You know, he spent 400. 54 and a half days in New York and 209 and a half days in California, things like that. Um, then in 2012 is this book. This is the latest one. And that's the other thing about this. Uh, he takes, a, from my perspective, a really annoying amount of time to create these. And I can imagine, like, you know, the amount of time it would take to make this is a long time. But these things don't, these don't come out until April, May. So I'm sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, and by now he's got enough of a following where you really have to be in tune with when he's releasing one to be able to purchase one. Um, so that's just an aside. Um, the project here at the back it says, this is the eighth volume of the Feltron annual report. The information within was collected using an iPhone app called Reporter, built by Drew Bruning. The report was designed with the help of Processing, MySQL, and Ryan Case. Typefaces used in including uh, domain and Cal uh, Calibre, I think, by Chris Sowersby and Filmotype Giant from You Work For Them. Um, so this is uh, another example. So in this, this round, he changed the approach. He used an app called Reporter, and you can actually buy it. And Eric has a copy of it on his phone, so uh, he'll sh share that later on uh, with anybody who wants to see it. And basically what Reporter does is that you time it to interrupt you every so often, how many ever times a day, and then you answer the, a certain amount of questions. So he's trying to capture his data in a little bit of a different way. So at random intervals each day, the app sent reminders to complete a survey. The results of these questions were saved alongside background measurements to form the basis of the documents. The questions they asked were, where are you? Are you working? What are you doing? What tools are you using? Who are you with? What are you wearing? what are you eating or drinking, and how productive were you today? And the way the app works is uh, it'll pop up and you only change the um, things that have changed since the last question. So if he's in a three hour meeting and the reporter pops up twice, he can breeze through a lot of those and just record another data point again and it will be a lot of the same data. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, cool. It also recorded seven background measurements, including date and time, latitude, longitude, and altitude, device battery and connectivity, other active iPhone applications, peak and average audio levels, numbers of photos added since the last um, measurement, and weather for where he's at. Um, 
So you can see the lenses. So there's his location pages. Here's his interaction with people on this side. His photos information. Uh, one thing that is interesting, let me jump to the, yeah, let's do this one. So this is the activity page. So you can see walking, listening, moving, reading, exercises, meeting. And inside then are different um, other data points related to that activity. But the entire page, if you look at like talking here, uses up an area on the page proportional to the whole. So if you look at this as a giant like pie chart, then this takes the appropriate amount based on the number of uh, data points represented by it. So it's just using um, a lot of different ways to go ahead and communicate that data. Um, then um, one interesting thing on beverage. Uh, can I say something about that? Yes. The, I, I've seen that before, but not since using the app. The app and the book look exactly the same. Using the app and seeing that book, that is what the app looks like. Yeah. When you it. It's got cool. like cut those same colors and huh. all the charts. Yeah. He's got a very distinct style. Um, and one of that, one of the characteristics of that is very fine print. So like I imagine none of you can see almost anything that's on this page. And when I'm reading it, it's up here, even with my glasses on. So uh, yeah, it's got a very interesting style. Um, one other thing, so uh, as we'll see later on, one of the things that people um, often track is alcohol. Uh, so uh, people like to track all the different types of beers they have or how much wine versus beer versus non-alcoholic beverages. And so in some of these other books, he has uh, outlined that very specifically and talked about all the different types of beers and all the different types of uh, things like that. Um, but he never tracked water. And so it always gave a, a distorted view of his um, consumption. Well, here with Reporter, there was a way to capture that. And so here, for the first time, uh, we get to see that his most reported beverage was water, which was actually 65% of his reports. Where on the other ones, it's completely um, uh, uh, unrepresented. You know, who wants to? hit a button saying, yeah, I'm having another glass of water. But when you use that reporter method, it's, you have to pick whichever one that you're, what, that you're there. Now he still has, you know, he had 71 um, IPAs and 55 severe Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. So, it's, so he's still doing that in different types of coffees and different things like that. But it finally, with this method, started to show that he actually is um, drinking, um, you know, unsexy water for 65% of his beverages. Um, so that's Nicholas Felton. Any questions or thoughts about him so far? Let's go on to Jahia. He's a, a hacker at Bitly. He's created annual reports since 2008. Uh, started with great data tracking and static displays, but has since branched out to really build um, interactive presentations. Um, so he does not, he's does not do books or printed material. So his 2008 um, exercise was really about finding different ways to capture different uh, data points from him. So he had visitors to his website, Google searches, songs listened to using like Last.fm, um, minutes on the phone, text messages. He created a little script to suck the uh, number of text messages out of uh, iPhone backup um, and was able to then track the number and, and who uh, each one went to. Um, minutes on uh, T-Mobile hotspots and dollars spent at Starbucks, things like that. So at the time was, was one of the most comprehensive views on personal data. And again, this is back to 2008. But then we see him shifting. So now he builds, uh, he's always built a page, but like the, the previous one, you could really print and hand to somebody and it would make sense. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. So now what he does is build um, uh, really neat ways to interact with the data. So for instance, here um, is a, um, uh, he takes a picture of himself every day through um, some means, I don't know how. And as you kind of hover over this, if your mouse is here, it'll pull up the, picture for May 10th, for instance.
So my mouse was hovering over this when I did the screenshot here at the beginning of December. So it's a way to interact and if you just slowly scroll over, you'll see the way he changes visually through the year, right? Um, the next here is his uh, coffee intake, which I love because I love coffee. Um, so he uses these box plots, enable us, enabling us to see trends. So there's this cafes that he's gone to, and he's breaking out the difference between weekdays and weekends to show the distinction, and also using these box plots to kind of tell the story of when and where he goes throughout a typical day and a typical week. Um, and again, as you hover over different areas of that, it's animating and changing all over the place. So he is really creating a web page to display his own data, uh, and really using some of his technical knowledge to display um, animation and other ways to, to kind of communicate that message rather than a printed material. Michael Anthony is the third one. He's an art director and designer in Philadelphia. Uh, has experience in both print and UX design. Has been creating annual reports since 2009. He's a runner, uh, which a lot of runners do this type of thing because it naturally lends itself towards quantified self type of um, tracking, right? Uh, Self-described as above average at Connect4. No proof on that, but, yeah. <laughs> um, so 2009, uh, his first um, public viewing, we see a poster design. So uh, we see a couple new states visited. We see his miles driven displayed uh, really elegantly as a trip around the world. Um, we see different uh, food intakes. Um, days in work versus free time, you can see that uh, red bar and the blue bar for the distinction there. So, uh, very nice using small iconography too to communicate the message. Uh, he grew two vegetables. There's a little bean, I think, and a tomato. <laughs> uh, as he goes further along, this is, I think, uh, this was his 2012 report. So you can see, he starts to again bring in little mini pictures. Here are the different uh, countries that he visited, and the number of days, and the, num and the percent along with each one, is, as well as other states that he's visiting. Um, and one of the themes here that you'll see um, is integrating little tidbits of story along with the raw data display. So at the top, he's got those, that raw data, but then at the bottom, he has travel thoughts. So uh, he says, visit Copenhagen in the summer. Um, let's see, near water, carry extra socks. Um, returning to the USA, don't leave fruit in your bags. Uh, and now he's gone to the point um, where the same type of displayed is, uh, of data is displayed in an amazing new way. So he has a, a fairly, consists of theme where he tracks running. <clears throat> so he even runs marathons. So he tracks um, number of miles run, he tracks uh, coffee consumption, um, tracks places he's gone, the standard type of things. And now he's got this um, kind of interactive, really probably makes the most sense to view it on a screen. Uh, but when you do, and actually, um, um, yeah, later, I guess we don't need to see it right now, but. Uh, it even has, oh yeah, here you can see it, um, the little zoom in and zoom out, kind of like the, and the placement up there, kind of like Google Maps, to interact with this massive um, sheet of information uh, that displays what he's doing. So he's, he's collected the data all year and as a way to have a fun exercise to play with, uh, to both analyze and visualize. So that's Michael Anthony. Let me make sure, yeah, that's it. So why do we do this? Uh, we want to learn about ourselves and you know, you think about um, a lot of this is just the reason why we do quantified self, period, right? Uh, learn about ourselves to change or improve ourselves and to have a fun data set to play with. Uh, Mills Baker has a quote there, it's a salient feature of our age that we have access to increasing loads of data but with no attendant increase in our self-knowledge or confidence in our ability to set goals and achieve them. So it kind of talks about how 
you know, we can collect all kinds of data through the different devices that we use or the different tracking methods that we use in the quantified self-movement. But if we don't take that next step to increase our self-knowledge and confidence in our ability to set goals and achieve them, what are we doing it for? Um, and personal annual reports are a great way to go ahead and achieve that. Um, so I have studied these guys for quite a while. Um, have attempted, I would say kind of half-heartedly attempted to do some, some uh, full year tracking in the past, never really got anywhere. Um, this year I'm doing better than I ever have and I think I might actually have a good handle on it. So uh, I'm hoping then this time next year I'll be able to share my own book uh, that has this type of stuff. So what am I doing? I'm doing location via Foursquare, which reminds me I haven't checked in here. That's one of the most annoying. I, I haven't trained myself to whenever I go to a new place to check in. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, photos via Pictory. So there's an app on the uh, on my tap on my computer that takes a picture at uh, whenever I log into the computer or wherever I, whenever a change uh, a song changes. I don't know why that is necessary, but uh, or whenever you start a new app. So it's um, just, just taking pictures at various times, and I don't have to think about it. Did it just take a picture of you when you logged in there, when the screen went blank? Uh, yeah, it would have, yes. Huh. Yep. Is it a free Mac app? Or it's, um, it's either there. free or maybe it was like $2.99 or okay. something. Oh, it, was, it was very cheap. And uh, I, I looked at several different options. That's by, by far the best That's, one I okay. found. Uh, and so, yeah, routinely I'll see a little green light on there pop up indicating it's taking a picture and then and that's it and so I've got all the pictures stored there and sometimes my kids are in the picture sometimes nobody is sometimes it sees me standing <laughs> up like this you know uh, so uh, photograph metadata obviously there's a ton of metadata associated with all the different photographs that we take so that'll be uh, right for analysis later purchases via Amazon and uh, you need a budget which is my um, personal financial management software was, uh, yeah thank you um, <laughs> So, what, is, what is you need the budget? It's a way to do envelope budgeting. So oh. it's just a way to track your spending. No, oh. it's, it's the best tool I've used to track spending and accounting. And everything this is like a that. manual tool, you mean? Or a yeah. Tool? Oh, well, manual tool. I, I take everything in from like my one account and I put it in here. But I mean, I've done other budgets before and I've tried to do like the spreadsheets and they always crumble. This mm -hmm. I've been doing it for over a year and everything's perfect. It's, it's okay. been my favorite software. Hmm. Yeah. But you could take anything, you know, you could use your. Uh, banks statements or your credit card statements or your or mint.com categorizations or whatever like last year uh, I, do, I purchased a ton off Amazon um, I purchased I think uh, I, I tracked it it was 175 different orders or no it was 130 orders with 175 items the highest was $160 the lowest was a penny um, and just uh, different things like that so I'll, I'll be able to uh, analyze that again um, I'm using Goodreads. One of the things that really kind of drove this uh, home for me was I went ahead and tried to retroactively track the number of books I read last year uh, and was embarrassed by the amount. I read, I read 14 books last year, um, which I was not uh, happy with. So, and you got to remember, I, so I've got these kids here that I, you know, tell them to read all the time. And I only read 14 books. Now, I read a ton, right? But it's all fluff. You know, it's it's blog posts and and you know stuff that wasn't really substantial. So that was very convicting for me to uh, to that I needed to change that. Um, so uh, I'm using Goodreads now to track that. Um, weight via the scale, beer via Untapped, thoughts via Day One. It's a journaling app. Music via Last FM and social via Slogger, which is a way that brings in. Um, it's a script that brings in your um, social activity into day one for, for later analysis. And you'll see there, though, the difference between active collection and passive collection. So uh, it's my view that you want to try to get as much passive as you can. Try to get those things where you don't have to think about it so you can get as, as, as holistic of a, a data set as you possibly can. Um, what a lot of people track, uh, transportation, especially for urban folks, that's really fun for people versus a um, train versus, you know, walking. Uh, 
Um, running, obviously, travel, food types, alcohol, sleep, words written, fun memories to remember, payment card usage. Um, here are some things that I've learned and then we'll look at further research and that'll be it. What I've learned so far is to start now, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today. So just start tracking. Uh, now, I, there's a lot of pressure to start on the first, right, the first of the year. Um, and I say forget that. So if you're interested in, in really looking at a co cohesive look or a comprehensive look of your year, start now. Um, if you want it to work, don't hack it. So um, for me, there were a couple of those things before where I could have some scripts, but they would take maintenance. I'd have to make sure they ran. Uh, that kind of goes back to trying to make it as passive as possible. Um, so if you have to get it to, if you, if you have to work on it to make sure that it's working, then you'll tend to work on it and then it'll delay and you, you won't have a chance to fix it, you won't have a chance to fix it and you'll, all of a sudden you'll have a two or three week gap in your data that you didn't want. You gotta find a way to deal with mistakes. So, uh, like you can ignore them. And mistakes could be uh, missing data, right? Or um, data that, that was just incorrect. Uh, so you can ignore them. You can go the reporter app type approach where basically, I mean, you, you need to clear those messages and you're kind of, you're tied to it. You have to get it done. You can ignore dates and time to enable past logging. That's what I'm doing on Foursquare. So I'll routinely realize, oh, I didn't check in at the place I went the other day. Um, for instance, after I went to the data scientist meetup on Thursday, it was here. And then I went, uh, it was the 13th, so I had to go to Kroger real quick and buy some Valentine's Day flowers for the next day. Well, I realized the next day, oh, I didn't check either of those. I didn't do a check-in for Lot Fishers. I didn't do one for Kroger. So I just did one when I remembered it. So for my data set, the times or the, the time and the dates are not good times and dates. It's all about just the number of places. Yes? Didn't you say that your phone or at least the... Or at least, uh, let's we'll just take reporter. You said mm -hmm. it takes track of where your location is at any given point to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're using something like that, why are you doing the uh, checking in with Foursquare? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, you know, obviously the reporter is really focused on latitude and longitude, which which takes a, another level of step to put that into English. So Foursquare already has a geotag where you're at. So yeah, so Foursquare it. enables like this, a list of places, right? Where um, if you, uh, what processing or what, um, I'm trying to think here, what latitude and longitude would be able to do is something like this, to show movement around, but not necessarily that I've been to Launch Fishers 15 times this year. That's why. So what you need is like almost a, passive way that you're not necessarily checking in, but your phone knows, oh, you're in this certain tag, which I know from Foursquare. Yeah. Without having you to tell it, go check it now. Yeah. And so um, a couple years ago when I tried this, Foursquare had a lot more limitations than it does now. So um, Foursquare, you know, some people do a lot of gaming on Foursquare to try to get a lot of badges and things like that. So as a result, Foursquare had a fairly restrictive view on what you could and couldn't do. So for instance, you couldn't check in if you were more than three miles away or something like that from that place. Well, like for my example, the other day I was at my home in Nora and I checked in at Fisher's and then at Kroger, even though I was in my house. So that enabled kind of that pass logging for me, which in the past, uh, before they made those changes, you couldn't do. Yeah, I can also check in um, like six different places in a row. So if I'm out and about and then realize I haven't done it at all that day, and you think about it, I just started this in January 1st, so I'm still not in that habit of when I get to some place, check in. And I, I'm not sure I really want to either, right? Just let me live my life and then I'll fill in the holes later. Um, so I can check in, oh, I went this place, this place, this place, this place, and just boom, 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 uh, and be done. Where that didn't used to be allowed because people would try to get, you know, badges or but stuff. It sounds like in order to be successful with this, it seems like you need to not think about it a lot, a lot of the processes. That's what I think, yeah. Yeah, you, you uh, just needs a system in place and work the system and not necessarily think about it. Yeah, well, it's just like, um, you know, I really fought against getting one of these Wi-Fi scales. I really did, because 
um, I just, every single time I think about it, I think, all I gotta do is write down the number. I'm gonna pay $100 so I don't have to write down one number one time a day, right? And then I'd come to these meetups and, and hear everybody talk about how they have it and show the charts. I'm like, well, I don't have that because guess what? I'm not writing down the stupid number, <laughs> right? And so finally, I just bought it and sure enough, on my phone, I have a chart of every single day yeah. since November. It's because surprising the data you can get from that too. Not yeah. just about your weight. Like you can like, well now what were the dates I went on vacation? Mm -hmm. Look back on your scale. <laughs> I didn't take my scale with me. Oh, oh it's a big, yeah. 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 It was. I left on that day. Yeah. 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 See your weight after and go to logic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I went on a good vacation. <laughs> and that that's so here is a uh, photos. Uh, data for uh, Felton and you can see these little big circles and he has little uh, labels on them right and so for me like um, you'll see big spikes on mine and I can say oh that's when the Super Bowl was because we had a bunch of food on that day and sure enough we had leftovers and you know I'm not throwing that stuff out so my cheat became a cheap week. So I find that a lot of the missing data you can go back in and fill in by using your other bits that are automated. Uh -huh. Your scale is surprisingly useful for me <laughs> to find my travel dates. Yeah, yeah, like that. that's, that's interesting. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's what that um, one of the last ones there is keep a mistake or edit log. So you can have a simple file where you can make edits so when you're pulling this information later, you can go in and, and know the changes that you need to make at the final conclusion. So in the beginning of the year, I wasn't doing past check-ins. So uh, if I forgot, I would try to go into the log and, and write it down to say, hey, I went to Fry's on this Saturday. So I would know my future self in early 2015 needs to add that data point. Well, I wasn't doing that. It was a lot more friction to do that than just to go in and check in. So I've made the choice to say, I would rather check in, in the, uh, and um, do away with the accuracy of my time and dates for the check-ins, rather than potentially miss one because I don't want to go in and update that file. Uh, and then finally, um, it's a good way to have a way to capture the time you saved an octopus. So, you know, that's one of the things that you can, you can track your weight and track the number of beers that you have, you can track the number of miles that you walked, but don't, don't not have a way to capture the time that you saved an octopus, so that when you can look back, you can find those neat stories that really make you who you are, you know, more than just a bunch of um, points on a, on a graph. Uh, further research um, options, Stephen Wolfram, has anybody heard of him? He created Wolfram Alpha, uh, probably the master of data collection. Uh, so he doesn't do as much and there's the type of thing, but for instance, I think he's captured every keystroke he's made for the last 30 years. Like, who cares? But he's done it. So he knows how many millions of times he's hit the F key. Right now, he's super rich, and he's got the capability of, and he owns his own company, right? And so he has these systems built in. He's got stats on his email from back to like 1993. Um, so there are some blog posts. There's one of those where you just kind of where you can be awed by the scale of what he's been able to accomplish. He doesn't do as much um, public, at least, display of stuff like this, but he really does a, a big time deal of collecting his own data. He knows when he sends email. Uh-huh, yeah. Like when in the day and like trends, like, oh, I worked at night more this year. and this Uh-huh, yeah. Like and then he can annotate it with little labels of, oh, well, we were getting ready to buy a company, so I can see my work shifting as I try to meet with people across the country, stuff like that. You can investigate how the masters changed their data collection focus over the years. Um, and obviously, this is a, a field that's really getting uh, more and more... Um, mainstream and and so like um, let's see Felton in one of these I think the year before talks about how he also used um, data collected with last FM and Fitbit so um, has everybody heard of last FM if you want to track music that's the way to do it so every time you if you connect your different music players it can send the song that you played at last FM and so at the end of the year you can have a pretty passive view of every single song you've played for, if you want to analyze that type of thing. Uh, most of these guys have GitHub repos, you can take a look. Um, interviews are somewhat sparse, 
uh, actually, but there are some out there. Um, and just kind of debate about how will wearables, more sensors, and connected services change data collection? And then how will that change the visualization of the data? So uh, some of the other books I've got up here are uh, from Edward Tuft. Has everybody heard of Edward Tuft? He is a, uh, a guy who um, really, like his, his um, kind of benchmark book, our main book is the visual display of quantitative information. So he studies and, and teaches on how do you take data and share it responsibly with decision makers and, and, and in, a, in a way to communicate um, the message that, that the data has, not the biases that you may have. So um, it's just interesting as these guys progress in their, and there's other guys that do this too, but as these three guys progress in their skill set and what they track, the, the visualization methods they use are also changing. And finally, I mean, the best thing to do for this is uh, have a great report by having a great life. So live your life every day uh, in a way that, that you're proud of and that you're happy with, and at the end of the year, then you're going to have a great report. That's it. Any questions? Well, that's it for me then, and uh, feel free to um, comment up, or maybe I'll just pass these around if you would like to take a look at them. Awesome presentation. Thank you.